Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Beyond Train Podcast. I'm your host, Leo Dalton. We have a very special guest on today, Dr. Sophie Fletcher, and we're going to delve into some very interesting topics, uh, definitely pertinent to what I'm going to be doing moving forward. I think central really to just what we're talking about in general here. And so, yeah, I think we're going to get into some really cool topics today. So, Dr. Fletcher, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Lovely to connect. So, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I always start the episodes off asking just a general question. I ask, what is health? What does health mean to you? You know, how does it look like? How does it manifest? And so I'll just give you the floor to, to answer that. All right. What is health? <clears throat> Well, I'll say when you said that, the first word that popped into my head was vitality. And I think that really covers a lot of arenas. Um, are you, you know, vitally engaged in your life in general? Are you learning? Are you pushing yourself? Are you in relationship? I think relationships are a huge part of health that... Um, often kind of go by the wayside sometimes, um, especially in such a technological age. Um, it can kind of feel a little bit more like, oh, we're you know connected to everyone and everything, but are you really like relating? Are you really with it? Are you aware of it? Are you embodied in it? Um, and I will also say that I think vitality sort of leads with embodiment. So if you're not here, if you're not present in your own body, in your own skin, in your own life, are you also vital? I don't think so. I think they have to come hand in hand. Um, so that'd be my short answer, I guess. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's, again, usually we we always get a, a great answer on this question and it's been different for every single episode, um, of course. Yeah. I love that you brought up uh, the relationships because you know, we're social beings and that's so important to nurture and foster healthy relationships. You know, you know, you could be as, as healthy as you want, you know, but if you're <laughs> just kind of isolated, you know, nothing, nothing good comes from that. And, you know, there's been some like, well, they've, they've observed cases of people who've been isolated and their health is not there. It deteriorates very quickly if they're isolated or if they lack you know, the relation, especially in children and uh, young, like young children, you know, like if they don't have any connection growing up. So uh, I think that's really a really, really interesting point and a really important point to bring up. I love that. Yeah. I mean, there were those studies in the Romanian orphanages where babies, if, you know, they're given all of the, they're kept at the right temperature, they're fed the right nutrition, you know, put in the quote unquote, ideal environment and everything, and yet they have no physical contact. The babies, I can't remember the word. I always, I always, always forget it, but it's, it basically means like it's, you, you don't develop, like it's wasting away. Um, mm -hmm. And it's literally like, we are social beings. We have social brains. We develop socially. We are mammals who need that interaction and that group and that you know, connection with others. Um, and there's, there's extremely important parts of us that don't develop if we don't have those, including our physical bodies, you know, not just our emotional and mental experiences, mm -hmm. but also our physical bodies need that stimulation. Um, and this, this wasn't actually something I was interested in until, I started my, uh, my dissertation for my PhD. It came sort of out of nowhere in my head. Um, but I feel like, you know, coming from more as, you, you know, depth psychological perspective and more youngness, it's like it was called, like, I feel like I was called to this topic for, and I'm still curious why um, it's still unfolding. But part of my main topic was the interrelational dynamics of contact. But that came from this sort of interest in how we relate with one another and what is happening between, you know, two 
bodies or to beings when they interact more than, you know, just the physical stimulation, but what else is communicating and happening. And over and over and over and over again, in all of the reading and research and studies and everything that I did, it was like, this isn't a luxury. It's not this nice thing to sort of have as like the side of your main meal of life. Like it is it is the foundation of our beingness is this relational dynamics and being in contact. So um, maybe that's where I came. I'd love to hear more about that. You know, maybe you want to open up about that and maybe a little bit of the work that you did in your dissertation specifically, like how you came to these conclusions as well. I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. I think that's so important. Sure. Well, the main spark of it was actually a particular book. Um, by Sandra Matthew Blakesley. And in it, I read about this neuroscience sort of discovery at the time um, of parapersonal space. And parapersonal space is this sort of like a few inches off of your body, this sort of amoeba area around you that moves with you. And when you touch something, so when you're in physical contact with it, this parapersonal space actually sort of engulfs what it is you're touching. And then that actually starts being tracked in your somatosensory cortex as part of you. Whoa. <laughs> but anybody just listening? <laughs> That's really interesting. All of a sudden, my background on my video had um, fireworks. <laughs> I don't know how or why. It was a nice little surprise. <laughs> Apparently, I guess that's on track. Um, that was funny. So anyway, so this parapersonal space engulfs what it is that you're touching. So and then it, in this matter of sensor cortex, it starts tracking that as part of your being. Um, now, obviously, the more you touch something, the more your brain sort of tracks it as potentially part of you. So one of my favorite examples of this is, have you ever been driving and you go under something low hanging and you physically duck? <laughs> and we all logically know that me moving my physical head is not going to have any impact whatsoever on whether or not the top of my car gets taken off. But especially if it's my personal car, my parapersonal space has mapped the outside of this car as my body, as sort of the outer layer of me. And so me doing that is just that instinct of, you know, sort of that taking over. Um, and what they were talking about was really this had been studied a lot in terms of inanimate objects so far in terms of people with artificial limbs. So you hear a lot now of people with artificial limbs, they can feel sensation within their limb, like they can feel their fingertips, even if it's an artificial limb. And it's this parapersonal space that engulfs it and sort of starts mapping it as part of ourselves. Um, they also studied this with like tool usage and things like people who um, use heavy machinery or like a rake, like certain things, they can start feeling the edges of these pieces. Um, and I started thinking like, well, does this also happen with inanimate objects? Okay. Does this happen with a, a person in relationship, animals, um, all of that? And I couldn't find anything where that had been studied. And coming from a bodywork background for myself, I had sort of had this experience where I'd be in these, you know, close contact with my clients and feel like a bit of like melting or feel like maybe the boundaries were getting a little blurry of like my body and their body um, or even leaving a session sort of feeling like something had sort of like come over me or something that wasn't necessarily mine. And I hadn't gotten any training in that or education. Like it was never mentioned like, Hey, PS, <laughs> your bodies are speaking to each other. And especially in these, you know, intimate experiences, there could be exchanges, things like that. And so I had gone on my own personal journey of finding out for myself, like, okay, what do I need to do? Like before a session, what do I need to do during a session? What, do I do after a session to kind of like reorient 
and, and come back to myself, like really sit more strongly within my own body. And, um, and so reading about the parapersonal space, those two kind of collided for me into this inquiry. Um, and so then my dissertation ended up focusing on the experience of hands-on body workers with their clients. And part of that was really because I felt like if I walked down the street and just asked, you know, 10 random people what their experience of touch is, I was probably not going to get a lot of information that I could use in any substantial way. And it would probably be pretty, um, it'd probably be entertaining. That's for sure. Um, But I wanted to really focus on one body workers because they're intentionally in contact with others. And, and so I thought that would be really helpful. And then it also seemed to be a, another gap in sort of research that I thought um, could have a little light shed on it, that there, there are these, you know, and in psychology, there's the understanding of transference and countertransference, and then the terms of somatic transference and somatic countertransference, where you'll feel something like countertransference would be me feeling something in my body that's actually the client's. Um, Mm -hmm. and so there's that sort of understanding, but then I was curious about it, even at that deeper level of like, if you're in contact with them, does that get heightened? Does that get shifted at all? Like what happens, um, with that? And so that was where the, the exploration took me. Um, and the main sort of like consensus (laughs) I'll say was the more embodied you are within yourself, the stronger you are in that capability to sort of feel into the other's boundaries and edges while also maintaining your own sense of self. So that was, I think the more that we gain our own self-awareness, get more somatically in tune with ourselves, that helps us be in actual relationship with another versus that melding over coupling or like being too scared to be in relationship because maybe we've had those experiences in the past and it was, um, you know, uncomfortable or anything like that. Cool. That's amazing. So this embodiment that you speak of, maybe you could break that down a little bit for the listener. Yeah. How do you, how do you get into this sort of embodiment? Like how do you foster that, you know, even in people that you're working with, cause I'm sure that's, that's a goal as well, right? You want them to really feel present in their body, like you were mentioning earlier. So Yeah. And a big part of that is really getting in tune with your, your own body because, and when I say that, I mean more of like the sensations of your body, um, getting in tune with the boundaries, borders of your own body, your own ideas and thoughts, your own voice, you know, um, it's sort of interesting how I feel like there's sort of this like umbrella experience of when you hear your own voice and it sounds so different (laughs) than, than like when I'm speaking, I sound one way and then I'll hear my voice and be like, is that me? That's so weird, (laughs) you know, but how can you get more comfortable with hearing your own self and, and, and your voice? Yes. But also like your sensations and most of my clients, you know, when I'm working with them and things, it'll be, this experience where at some point they'll say like, I feel like I'm in kindergarten and I'm so frustrated because, you know, I work with adults and it's sort of like, well, you are like, we kind of are as, as like a, you know, a culture We're we're a little bit in kindergarten around this. I think, um, I think we used to be much, much more in touch with it. And we're sort of coming back to this experience of feeling our bodies and being here in this physical world. Um, because I think a lot of it at the moment, it's really enticing to be just in the intellect, just in the mind and, or secondarily sort of like flight dissociated more in that, um, like dorsal frozen state sort of dissociated from our beings because it's uncomfortable and it has all these like aches or pains or just traumas, you know, that we've had throughout our life. And so we sort of learn that being here, feeling this physical experience just isn't necessarily all that great. Um, all the time, uh, And so the more we can get in tune with that. So really simple ways are even just, you know, us sitting here right now or whoever 
you know, is listening to this, feel into like, can you feel your body touching whatever it is that's holding your weight? If you're standing, maybe that's just the soles of your feet. If you're sitting, maybe that's, you know, the back of your body, down the back of your thighs. Can you feel where your body is actually in contact with something else? And what is that like? Can you feel that little, little tiny bit of space in between your body and the other and sort of like allow it to be held, but like receive the holding and hold yourself at the same time? Does that make sense? So it's kind of like, I can feel my muscles relaxing. And at the same time, there's other muscles that are activated because I'm sitting up straight. So tuning into that, what is it like to feel certain muscles that are relaxing and being held and other ones that are holding your body in a specific position? Another thing is to tune in. Are you comfortable how you're sitting? A lot of times when I ask a client that, or if I, you know, I do lead groups and stuff, um, when I ask that, it's like many people will shift. It's like, well, (laughs) why were you sitting in an uncomfortable position? (laughs) You know, generally, if we're all adults, we're all capable of moving our body position and, and helping ourselves get comfortable or asking You know, a lot of people, it's like, can you use your voice to ask for, do you need a pillow or do you need a blanket? Are you a little bit cold? Are you a little bit hot? Like, have you actually tuned into that? And the vast majority of the time, it's like people aren't constantly tuning into that. And I'm not saying it needs to be every single moment of every single second, but the more we do it, the more it doesn't have to be this like intentional process. It can just be like, oh, I'm uncomfortable. I'm going to move. Versus, oh, I've been sitting in this uncomfortable position and I didn't even notice. I didn't even realize what was happening because I wasn't here. I wasn't really present in my own body and what's happening to the sensations that I'm feeling. Um, Another thing is like, when you need to pee, go pee. You know, (laughs) when you're hungry, Get something to eat. Like the, it's not rocket science. It really is sort of kindergarten. But how many of us, if we went to traditional schooling, we were told when you're allowed to pee, when you're allowed to move or walk or run or play, when you're allowed to eat, when you're allowed to have water. We have to ask permission for these things from the adults around us. Well, Okay, so we adapted to be able to sort of survive in that situation, but we're now adults. Mm-hmm. Or maybe, you know, kids are listening to this. But if you're an adult listening to this, like you can generally, I don't know in what circumstances, if you needed to pee, somebody would be like, no, you're not allowed. Like, I'm 38. Who's going to tell me I'm not allowed to pee? <laughs> That's just something. But it's like how many of us have sort of numbed that out? And it's like, oh, no, I'll do that later. Or I don't even notice until it's like, oh, I really have to pee. Hmm. You know, and so really getting just just those subtle um, hints, those subtle whispers from our bodies of like, hey, this is what I need or this is what's happening or this is what I'm feeling. And then actually responding to it. And that builds that communication between your awareness and your body. And and it is, it leads that more embodied experience of, Oh, I'm actually here and I'm feeling what's happening. Um, And that's, you know, as I said, a lot of us have also been trained out of that because maybe it was uncomfortable at certain times, or it was safer to sort of numb out and dissociate. Um, That was very much part of my story um, was just through a series of events. When I was little, I learned to dissociate that was much more comfortable (laughs) to not really be here, not feel physical discomfort. And so I learned to dissociate. And then I got involved in a spiritual community. um, And that spiritual community did save my life 100% because I sort of got taught that if, if I were to commit suicide, just to be blunt, then I would, in that sort of understanding, I would just have to come back and live it again. And I was like, well, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Um, And this was actually at four years old. So I started having suicidal ideation at three 
because of certain things that happened in my life. And at four, I was taught this. And at four, I was like, that sounds like a bad plan. I'm already four years in, maybe I just continue going. But my way of continuing going was to just dissociate. And then in the spiritual community, it was very um, geared towards more like meditation, uh, transcend the body, be above the body. So if the body is like the lesser, um, you know, the the bad part of us or whatever that we have to get above. Yep. And, um, and so that sort of fed for me into my own trauma response. Oh my gosh, I just did... <laughs> Just did fireworks again. I don't. Maybe it's a certain hand gesture I'm doing. I'll try to keep my hands down now. Um, <laughs> but so it fed into that for me, and really, eventually, sort of strengthened my own trauma response of going more into that dorsal shutdown, frozen state. And it wasn't until my mid twenties when I ended up sort of getting involved in this community that where one of the people was a body worker. And part of the body work was walking on the person's body. And so he started walking on my body. And I, I mean, I had so much pain. I had so much pain. And I'd been doing all of this spiritual work and all this karmic work since I was four. So I was like, what is happening? Why is there so much? I should be, you know, I should be great. And, he, and it, it, it clicked for me where I was like, oh, it's actually here. Like my lesson is to be here, to feel this, to be um, with the pain, to not dissociate, to not numb from it, to really be here and experience this level of discomfort and stay. And that was so hard. <laughs> um, but also really it's, it, it ended up giving me like a second saving of my life because I felt like, oh, I, I'm actually here now. I'm actually engaged in what's happening. I'm actually aware of the sky above me and the beautiful trees outside and the, the soft chair under me right now. And I have a, you know, a sort of velvety blanket across my lap right now. And like, oh, I can feel those things too. Mm -hmm. um anyway that was a long winded mm -hmm. um answer but embodiment sort of being here being being just engaged with the experiences of being in a body so even just more engaged with like the five physical senses um not discounting in any way shape or form the more senses that we have you know accessible to us and at the same time like can you smell the beauty of a flower can you taste delicious food? Can you feel, you know, a really nice texture of a blanket? Can you, like, can you hear this, the bird songs as well as all the discomfort that comes with it? But yeah, I think we're here on this, you know, physical reality of for some reason. If So why not? And why not feel it? <laughs> why not be here? <laughs> yeah. Feel the good and the bad, right? It's about yeah. feeling it all. Like. Yeah. yeah, I like they highlighted that. And my fiance actually uh, took a yoga course and in it, like they always talked about this grounding exercise that was just to come back to your senses, you know, like name five things you can see, five things you can hear, five things you can, you know, taste is the kind of the hardest one, but <laughs> five <laughs> things you can touch, you know, so um, and it's always really good if you get worked up and you can kind of come back to your body just by engaging with these senses, which I think is really powerful. And Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, I kind of think that one of these mechanisms of like of storing people talk about storing trauma or storing our emotions is when you don't feel it. Right. And there's this idea. I don't know if you agree with this or your thoughts on this. Maybe you can expand on that after. But, you know, there's this idea that we store it physically in our body, you know, like. And that's why we hold tension in our muscles in certain areas in the body correspond to different areas and where you're holding tension and what kind of stress it is, or if you repressed it for this long, whatever it may be. Right. So, um, and I always thought that was really interesting. And I mean, that to me really opens up this whole, you know, it's so obvious that there's a somatic component to all of this. It's so obvious that we need to take care of our physical body. It's not useless. And I don't, 
really like that ideology, you know, that we have to demonize the physical realm. Is, you know, are we living in this materialistic biochemical construct of the world? Absolutely not. That is not what I'm saying. But, you know, we can't necessarily discount our senses, right? We can't discount what we can feel and what we can see, what these material objects like. And the way that you're talking about how you were relating to these, oh, I just, anyways, maybe I'll let you have a comment on that before I go off further. Yeah, I absolutely agree um, that we hold a lot of these sort of repressed or suppressed energies within us. So in our physical bodies and you know, I mean, Jung, in in sort of like my studies of depth psychology with somatics, the the main sort of overarching theme was that our bodies hold our unconscious. And so by going into the body, you're really reaching into these unconscious areas and, and pieces. And even um, now it's sort of like all my work is sort of based in somatics, anything that I sort of study. But Like with the body work, I had that personal realization really strongly where um, I had this one instance where my teacher put my body in like a a certain physical position and it wasn't a normal sort of natural position that I ever remember being in. But as I was in that position, I had this memory come flooding back to me that I, I had zero awareness of prior. Um, and I think it was, it sort of got unlocked within my psyche. And I do think that our psyche has sort of like a filtering system for us as well, in terms of it's going to allow to come to the surface, what you are now maybe ready to process. So as you said, when we go through these traumas or when things happen, a trauma for me, Um, in my sort of thoughts is anything that's overwhelming to the system that can't be processed or sort of felt entirely in the, in the moment because it's too much. Maybe it could be unsafe too. So there's times when our, you know, autonomic nervous system will come online and be like, "Uh uh-uh, we're going to numb out from this because that's the, the most saving and the highest probability of survival that I can give to the system right now. Right. So it's doing it out of protection, but it doesn't just go away. (laughs) You know, that that sort of saying, like, time heals all. Um, I have a real problem with that (laughs) saying, because, no, it just sort of gets stuck in there somewhere within the system. And then your body's having to sort of figure out what to do. And the more and more we suppress down, the more and more we're holding down within our system, the more energy it's taking from us to hold these things down and under versus allowing it to sort of be felt and be processed through. Um, So even in like somatic experiencing, which is one of the main works that I utilize from Peter Levine, he talks about like how um, all of our joints hold a lot of affect within them because it's sort of like the main, it's sort of space within our body. And so energy can kind of get stuck there. And so a lot of people have more joint issues, you know, chronic joint pains or aches or things like that. Um, there's, you know, as you said, you know, the different correlations of the places in the body. And there are multiple different schools of thoughts around that, of like which areas correlate with what and, you know, different things in terms of like most of my training has had a Chinese meridian basis, um, within it. But then, um, you know, there's, you know, I'm also, I'm, I'm being curious about like biofield tuning and they have a different, you know, map and then there's the chakras and then there's super road and then, you know, all the different things. And, um, and I've even been studying a lot more of like German new medicine and stuff. And so then it brings in a whole other sort of layer and everything. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I just, I agree with that strongly from my own experience, as well as seeing it very, very clearly with clients. Um, and even part of that, that trauma sort of getting stuck in the body just from a physiological sense too, is, um, like when there's a, when something happens, there can be multiple impulses that our body wants to play out in order to stay safe or help us survive. Mm -hmm. So 
think about it like if you were, you know, driving and you see like a car coming, you know, at you from one side, there may be part of you that wants to like turn the wheel in a certain way or look away or do something and or maybe, you know, there might be another impulse to like put your hands up to shield yourself and the other impulse is to turn the wheel to try to get away. You can only do one of those. But the other impulse is still sort of stuck within your system. So a lot of sort of more of the somatic experiencing work is sort of playing those out, like playing what might have wanted to move through your body, through your body now in the present moment so that it can sort of gain access to that. So just a personal example was that was we um, I was on like a, one of those big yoga balls. And we were having it like just moving around on it. And um, I was the client at the time. So I was on this ball and I noticed that every time I went forward, I would feel more tensing in my body. It was pretty subtle, but I was I was just like aware that that felt different than like the sides or the back or anything. And I was kind of like, I don't know what that is, but I'm, I'm just noticing like my my muscles are tensing in a certain way whenever I sort of roll a little bit forward. And as we worked with it, this memory came back to me of, and very simple, but I tripped um, on a curb and fell. And I was with some friends. I wasn't, you know, massively injured or anything. I think my ego was a little bruised because people had seen me fall. And I was like on the street and, you know, I don't know where I was in Santa Monica or something, you know, and I had a bruised and like little bit of a skin knee. You know, so nothing to write home about, nothing that would be like, oh, my God, I had this traumatic experience today. But for whatever reason, in my body, it remembered that experience and it had wanted to fall in like a different way than I did fall, if that makes sense. And so then we sort of played it out of if I were physically played it out of like, okay, if I fell this way, what would have happened or if I fell that way or just kind of playing with it. Because this is where our system sort of gets stuck and a little bit frozen sometimes of like, oh, I fell this time in the past and it worked. So next time I'd probably fall the same way, even if there was maybe a better way, right? So having done that, now my body has more freedom to try out different ways of falling. And then Mm -hmm. once we sort of played them all out and then we did it again, it's like, oh, my body didn't tense up anymore when I went in that, in that, um, forward motion. So even just at like the very sort of base physiological state, yes, our bodies remember all these things and sort of hold all these different experiences and tensions. Um, and then the deeper layers are the, the, the memories and the emotions and the energy that's sort of stuck within our beings as well. And, coming sort of full circle again, back to that embodiment piece. Like if we're not embodied, we're not feeling it. Mm -hmm. We're not aware that it's there, that there might be something deeper under the surface that could really shift our experience of life, like shift chronic pain, Um, Mm -hmm. things like that. Amazing. So can we hold on, like, can we extrapolate this to sort of like interactions as well? Like, oh, I wish I would have said this or spoken up or maybe, you know, because I always feel like after an interaction, you're like, oh man, I really should have said that. Or if you were arguing, whatever, like, (laughs) can you kind of hold on to those things too? Like, I guess it's kind of good afterwards to say, oh, I wish I would have said that. Maybe you're kind of thinking the situation through a little bit, but you know, maybe you might miss that too, right? And then maybe it gets a little pushed under the rug. Yeah. And it's good as to feel those impulses and then to sort of play with it. As I'm saying, like same thing, like have that conversation out loud if you can in the head, it can just kind of get a little circular um, with yourself. Um, But if, you know, if you can have a private space or even, you know, discuss it with a loved one or a close friend or whatever, who can hold more of like a neutral space. It's like, Hey, I wish I had said that. Or how do you think that would have gone? Or, you know, just sort of play it out for yourself because then you're giving yourself the experience of playing with it, more curiosity into the experience. Um, And I even tell people, so um, I use a lot of, (laughs) I use a lot of examples of, of telling people to go to the bathroom. 
and not necessarily to actually physically go to the bathroom, but because generally it creates a little space from wherever you are to uh, where you can express something. So um, one of the big things that I'll tell people to do, do is growl because we are these animal bodies. So of course we have all this higher consciousness now and all these other things happening, but physically our, our bodies are very animal and it developed from that. So um, animals in the wild, when you're watching them, generally the first sign that they're going to give or one of the, the main signs they're going to give of a boundary is they're going to sort of show their teeth and maybe growl a little or hiss or, you know, make some sort of vocalization. Hmm. Now, if we're walking down the street and someone, you know, bumps into your shoulder, I'm not suggesting that you turn around and growl in their face. (laughs) Generally, that's an act of aggression. So we don't want to be doing those things. And yet there might be an impulse in your body to do that. So then find a place where you can actually go act that out. You know, so I say to people, you know, who work in like an office arena or if you're visiting, this is just always the easiest one. If you're visiting family. You know, and generally our parents or siblings are going to know the exact buttons to push (laughs) and what to say and all the things. So can you go to the bathroom and you can flush the toilet while you do it so, you know, they can't hear you, but go to the bathroom and be like, just because you're, again, you don't want to do that most likely in your mother or father's face. But allowing that impulse to still move through your system. So instead of suppressing it, just be like, I need a minute, (laughs) you know, and going and doing that or pushing against the wall or wringing a towel or, you know, I have, there's tons of these tips or tricks or whatever. But the main thing is just to feel into your body and be like, what's the impulse that it needs to do right now so that those energies don't get stuck, so that they don't get repressed into the system. And you can continue sort of feeling and, and moving through and, you know, staying as present as possible. Yeah. Cool. Love it. <laughs> Maybe you could touch on the role the nervous system plays in all this. What role doesn't it play? <laughs> it sort of touches and, and, you know, sort of navigates everything. Um, and when I talk about the nervous system, I'm talking about the autonomic nervous system. So I'm talking about all these auto, automatic things in our bodies. So our physiology, heartbeat, digestion, respiration, all of those things. Um, but, and I come from more of like the polyvagal Stephen Porges background. So thinking about how we have ma- two main sort of systems, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And then the parasympathetic has two branches underneath it. It has the ventral and then it has the dorsal. Um, And all of those systems, so the nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, its only job is to help us survive. And it is always, always, always just trying to do that. So it is always surveying everything around us being like, how do I stay safe and how do I survive? How do I stay safe and how do I survive? And what happens is when we're little, 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 there can be experiences where the the, the nervous system takes those into account, sort of makes a list, you know, it sort of has the history books of like, what has worked? Um, what helped me stay safe? What helped me survive in certain situations? Um, and so it adapts into how that works. So maybe there were a certain number of times or extended periods of times when you were crying or you needed attention and there wasn't any given. The system, because when we're born, we don't have the ability to self-soothe yet. It's just not developed. It's not that the baby, there's something wrong with it. It's literally just not a part of its being. It has to learn that through that co-regulation with the parents. So that's part of that withering away we were talking about of not getting that touch, not getting that nurturing. And so that doesn't develop within us. So if that happens as sort of enough, most of the time a baby can't fight and it can't flight. You know, it's it's an infant. <laughs> it's it fully, 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 fully um, 
needs this other being to take care of it, to help it survive. Mm -hmm. So what it'll do is the, the autonomic nervous system will sort of be like, okay, well, I can't fight what's happening. I can't flight away from what's happening. So I'm going to go into my most extreme form of survival and defense, which is our dorsal vagal. And that's that shutdown that I was talking about a little bit more frozen can go into like dissociation, disembodiment. And that's like that numb out because it's the pain can be so overwhelming that it's like, oh, I'm just going to numb out so that I don't feel this because there's nothing I can do about it. You know, and then we sort of grow up and maybe now there's little instincts or impulses to fight or to flight a little bit more. Um, And maybe we try it and that gets stifled or we get yelled at. Um, And so we sort of learn like, "Mm, I don't know if that's correct, you know, if that's going to help me survive, but maybe it does. So maybe I fought back and I won in some way. And so the nervous system takes that. Um, and sort of stocks that away as a possibility. And um, the nervous system is sort of stacked in like a ladder kind of situation. So if you think of the bottom of the ladder as the dorsal vagal, so that's sort of our, our most extreme, as I said, most extreme form of defense and survival. And then you sort of go up the ladder into the sympathetic, which is that fight flight system. And then you go up the ladder into ventral vagal. That's going to be our safety, our connection. That's where we can be in relationship with others and actually be present to it. But a healthy nervous system is being able to go through all of these states flexibly in the correct sort of um, orientation to when something's happening. But when we're like, if a baby get sort of stuck in that dorsal state if they were neglected to certain degrees or for whatever reason that sympathetic wasn't available. And so they learn that that dorsal, that shutdown, that frozen is the the best way. They're going to be tend towards a little bit more like depression, apathy, um, a lot more procrastination, having a hard time getting oneself going. The sympathetic, if you, you know, go into that, as I said, if you have like a fight and you win or, you know, something positive happens from being in more of the sympathetic fight flight situation, that gets logged away. And maybe you tend to a little bit more like anxiety or hyperactivity or um, hyper awareness, hyper vigilance, because it's sort of like on guard. You're in the sympathetic, like, oh, I'm ready at any moment to fight or flight. Right. Um, Mm. And then being in that ventral vagal, if you become comfortable in these other two can feel really uncomfortable. If you didn't have that nurturing, if you didn't have the relational dynamics happening, being nurtured within your system, then that can feel like, oh, I don't know, because a lot of a lot of trauma is relational because of those those young experiences where we needed the other. We needed the other in order to survive, right? And so then as we grow older, we may not need them anymore, but there's still that part that's like, oh, but I I can't be completely alone. So I need that ventral vagal, but it's also dangerous. I need it, but it's dangerous. I need it, but it's dangerous. Um, So it's just interesting to sort of like have the awareness of your own system of like, where do I tend? Mm -hmm. where Where am I most comfortable where do I need a little bit more like, you know, flexibility in there? Um, one of my favorite studies that uh, I can't remember the name of it for some reason right now, but um, they took a, a group of um, extreme meditators of monks and then they took a group of um, just sort of like regular people, whoever, and they were expecting that these monks would have sort of like zero stimulation within their system if something happened. They would just sort of stay really, really neutral and zen. Um, and that sort of like the regular people would be like all over the board. And, and so they would put somebody in a room and then they would slam a door. So they were trying to startle the person. And what they found was that for the monks, they actually had a higher 
rate within their system of stimulation, but then they came down really quickly. So they would sort of like get this massive stimulation. They would figure out, oh, it was just the door. And then they would come straight back to level. Whereas other people would get a lower stimulation, but they would stay there. So that's what I mean by having this flexibility within your nervous system where it was correct for them to have a high stimulation to a door slam out of nowhere, but then to come back to sort of neutral, you know, stable. Whereas the other people, it was like you, they didn't have the capacity to go to as high of a level of stimulation, but then they couldn't calm down as quickly. And so part of this nervous system work is gaining that capacity within the system so that you can feel, as we were saying with this embodiment, like you can feel the good, you can feel the bad, you can feel all in between it and actually be with it, be present with what's happening, um, and then sort of like flexibly move through the states as is needed. Sure. None of them are better or worse. And, you know, the... The adaptations that we create because of, oh, this has worked in the past. And so this similar, this situation might be sort of similar. So I'm just going to do the same thing in our system. Um, They can become maladaptive as we grow up. So while they were adaptive when we were little, because it helped us survive and it helped you stay safe in whatever way, um, is now possibly maladaptive because we have more capabilities as we grow older. We can fight, we can flee, we can feed ourselves, we can self-soothe ourselves, we can ask for assistance, you know, all these different various things that are come online over time. And so I always say like the biggest, biggest thing is having compassion and gratitude for your nervous system, because if you're here, you're sitting in that room. I can see you on the computer. Anyone who's listening to this, congratulations. Your nervous system has done its job. It has kept you alive. That's a major, major success. Great. Wonderful. Celebrate it. Have so much gratitude for that. And if there's pieces of it that feel now maladaptive, it's okay. Now we can start to consciously shift those. And the more embodied we are, the more aware of that we are, the more choice we have around making different decisions and reteaching our nervous system. It's Hmm. just going off of sort of experience. So if we give it new experiences, it learns and it shifts along with it. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great way to kind of explain the the inner workings in a way, right? Like it's it's helpful. So really curious about your thoughts on psychotherapy. Uh And uh, I think that there's a a little distinction between like traditional psychotherapy and this sort of modern cognitive behavioral focused therapy. Yeah. Um, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. (laughs) Um, I may get in trouble with this one. Um, I am, I think that traditional therapy has its role and it can be very helpful. I also believe that it's limited in its abilities because rehashing, retalking about everything that's happened to you is not necessarily meaning that you are processing it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's changing your orientation to things. Sure, you may get some awarenesses, you may get some new insights, and and that's what I mean. It can be really helpful. And at the same time, for me, if you're not including the body, if you're not including this massive experience of you that is literally the part of you that's taking in every experience that you've ever had, through your, through your senses and storing it, you're not getting to the deeper layers. You're not really shifting the experience in, in a true and sort of integrated and lasting way. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also sort of 
things now where it's like if you're just sort of retelling like the same stories, one, it can get sort of apathetic. You can kind of numb out from it. But it also might be a signal that like you're going into more of that dorsal shutdown state because you're not actually with what's happening. So one of the things that I always say with more of the somatic work is, yes, my clients or whoever I'm talking to and things, we can tell stories and I do want to know bits about your history and things like that. But my main concern or what I'm mainly focused on with people is what's present now. So not necessarily what happened then, but how is what happened then still present for you now in the here and now? How is that still alive in your body? So if if somebody's telling me, you know, one of their traumas or what happened to them, it's like one going really, really, really slowly. Because as we were saying, in a traumatic event, your system gets overwhelmed, well, retelling it, your system can get overwhelmed again. So it's really going really, really slowly and be like, hey, can you feel that? Can you feel what you're saying? What do you notice in your body as you're saying this? What affect is coming up? Are there any images that are coming up? Any behaviors that want to sort of move through you? Any impulses? And sort of being with like moving it through in the here and now of what's Mm -hmm. now present And maybe we'll go in like little tiny chunks because there's also the idea of titration. So instead of just, you know, tell me your biggest trauma for an hour, (laughs) (laughs) like maybe we work with like, you know, the first uh, second of the experience for an hour because it's too overwhelming. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. And then I'm probably going to be like, hey, did you notice that the trees are starting to bloom outside? Oh, I really like your shoes today. Those look really comfy, you know, because we want to sort of like dive in and then come back out and then dive in and come back out and dive in and come back out. That titration through the system so the system isn't getting overwhelmed so that we're not re-traumatizing the system as we're retelling whatever stories have happened to us and we're actually able to then be present with it and feel it and move it through the system. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do think psychotherapy is very, very helpful. And I think that it can also be at times detrimental if you are just going in and sort of rehashing the same things over and over, or if you're telling stories and you're numbing out or you're not really present with what's happening, or you're you're just sort of re-traumatizing yourself by, Mm -hmm. let me just regurgitate this whole thing again. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So like going back and and reliving it without processing it is the the detrimental component of it, right? That's what you're saying here. And so in processing it, you're like, you're kind of alluding to that somatic component or, you know, the, Maybe you want to punch something or something something along these lines. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Like you need exactly. to have this this somatic, this movement attached to the thought or feeling to kind of yeah. create that safety. Is that what we're hitting at here? Yeah. And it may not be like a physical movement. It can be when I talk about those impulses or behaviors that maybe want to come forward. Um, yes. But also it can be that affect that maybe you really wanted to cry. And for whatever reason, that wasn't accessible for you at that time. But you're retelling the story. I mean, how many times can somebody be retelling a story and like the tears well up? And then it's like, oh, no, no, no. And, you know, they start talking like a little bit faster and they get through their story. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. (laughs) Like, (laughs) wait, wait, maybe we just allow that emotion to actually come up now that it's safe, now that it can be expressed in this container and actually create that feeling of safety within our system to be able to allow that to come forward. Maybe it's an image that comes forward for you. Maybe, um, you know, it's just like something links to something else. Um, So it doesn't necessarily have to be these physical movements, but it can be just anything that's sort of present with it. Yeah. Cool. And so I guess one of the goals, like you were mentioning, these maladaptive patterns, like that's almost the way that it manifests in the present, right? You have these, these situations that occur in the past 
And now we're in the moment. And based on those situations, we're acting in this certain way or have these certain responses to the situation. And that's what you're trying to address there now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the goal of, for me, of anything that I study, it's sort of looking at like, how does this create more freedom and more space within the person's being? Mm. Because I don't want, I don't want it to be like, oh, I'm telling you exactly what to do or how to be. Um, No, I want to create the space or, or the freedom within your own system to be able to explore what's correct Mm. for you. I don't know. I'm not in your body. I can't feel all the same things or the experiences. Like that's up to you. It's your responsibility for how you want to live your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm more like sort of to hold that that co-regulation state space within a system. Um, and even I don't know if I don't know if you've studied, but human design um, and stuff. So I get really into that. I love that. Um, And one of the big things that they talk about is like conditioning. It's sort of, for me, it's like the same, it's it's just another variation of saying those mal, you know, adaptations that have become mal adaptations or ways that we've taken things on from others. Um, But this conditioning that's happening just naturally by being in relationship, by being around just physically around other people when I walk into a coffee shop, things like that, like my system's being conditioned. Um, it's not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with it. But the more that I know myself, the more I can be aware of, oh, that's a conditioning. Do I still yeah. want that? Or is that mm-hmm. not really serving me anymore? So again, with my clients, I'm doing the same thing. Even if I'm just doing a human design reading or bringing human design into the sessions, it's like, what works for you? And what doesn't like, this is maybe how, like from this system, this is sort of like describing pieces of your design, but then experiment with it. Try it out. I don't know. Pers- like I'm not hmm. the expert of you. I'm just creating information and maybe some sort of like breath around how we've been trained or conditioned or adapted to be in the world. Cool. So like, <laughs> Do you think that Jung was trying to get at this? Because he talked about like complexes, of course, and, um, you know, how these complexes can be maladaptive too. But, you know, I, I guess when he spoke of it, it was like everything's kind of a complex, whether it's maladaptive or not, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that that's what they were trying to get at through psychotherapy, right? Through that exploration. Like, would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I think it's interesting. So one of the things that I I was sort of curious about in sort of like the history of psychotherapy is, you know, yeah. Freud um, being sort of like the grandfather, if you will, of it and stuff. But one of his main things was, you know, the therapist sits behind the client um, out of view and it's sort of this like disembodied voice sort of mm-hmm. behind them. And you're in this reclined position and it's just sort of like speaking everything, you know, um, that comes forward. And and so sort of for me and, and especially I came up with this in the dissertation it was like Freud for him, it was like the, the therapist doesn't even have a body let alone yeah. the client. like nobody has a body in this situation because you can't see anything. Um, mm-hmm. And then Jung changed it so that you were facing each other. So for Jung, I feel like the body actually came back online within yeah. his own being as well as the other. And he had more of an understanding and awareness of this interrelational dynamic. And I believe he did, he would sort of like, I mean, yes, he was much more interested in the unconscious, but he talked about how the body held the unconscious, you know, yeah. and, and, and it, there was also this other piece going back to your question with psychotherapy um, of the idea was that the person, the client would be, you know, telling the truth, nothing but the truth and only, but the, only the truth kind of thing. Um, but as I said, like our psyches have these, these filters sort of inbuilt of, and so they also sort of, you know, found that a client would be telling them what they thought 
the therapist wanted to hear. Absolutely. Or they'd be sort of skewing things into ways, you know, because none of us want to look bad. <laughs> I mean, that's just a natural human instinct is not to sort of degrade yourself too much or to put yourself in a bad light. Like anytime I'm listening to a story, it's like, okay, I know that there's like other pieces here. You know, there's mm-hmm. more flesh on this than is what's being told. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That's not lying. It's just a, a just subjective awareness um, that comes with that. But then it was Reich who then started touching the body and sort of using mm-hmm. more of this bodywork modality. And that was when he discovered that of like, oh, my clients are only telling me what they think I want to hear or creating certain mm-hmm. stories that are happening. And then once going into the body, you get a very different story. You get a very mm-hmm. different experience. I mean, even just for me of, I thought, I mean, I was ex- severely dissociated from my body um, in my 20s, you know, from three until my mid 20s. But I, but from the outside, I looked happy. I looked engaged. I had, I had already done my first master's in spiritual psychology and I was seeing clients and I was teaching at a preschool and things like that. And then as soon as that teacher walked on my body, it was like, oh, there's the truth. There's mm-hmm. the actual truth of what my experience is of not wanting to be here. Um And that, again, that was just what shifted me into like, oh, the body has to be included in all this. And it, I'm not saying body work. That was my avenue. But like, I see clients online over Zoom. Well, because as I'm saying, I can ask a lot of questions that are sensation oriented. I can ask them to, because the whole point is for you as the client, whoever I'm talking to, to be gaining that within yourself to be getting in touch with yourself, to be feeling your own body, feeling what's happening within your system. So I don't have to physically be there um, in order to sort of cultivate that or point in those directions or ask, you know, questions more oriented to that or, um, you know, things like that. So I don't necessarily think I'm not exact. I'm not like a (laughs) Reikian. I'm not like full Jungian. I'm sort of like, put everything together and see what happens. And there's been a ton, you know, traumatology has had massive, massive developments in the past, like 20, 30 years of just completely new revelations, even in terms of like polyvagal theory and things like that. So um, I think just the way that things are oriented. And at the same time, I think Jung had such foundational and beautiful ways of relating and, and describing the human experience that were so needed sort of along the way as we're always going. Um, Cause I just think that the human experience, the exploration of the human experience is at least for me sort of like, I don't think it's ever ending or maybe I'm mm-hmm. just, limited in my view that it could be, but, um, I don't know. I mean, your experience is completely different than mine. So that's an endless exploration. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if we can learn anything from young, it's that, you know, he explored pretty well until the day that he went and, you know, only right before he passed, it was, he had this feeling of enlightenment now is, Jung's interpretation of the psyche and the development of the psyche over time was that individual I've heard some great criticism on that you know that um, you don't necessarily have to develop the anima or the animus later in life which would be the male or female counterpart of the psyche or I should say masculine or feminine counterpart of the psyche yeah you know there's a some schools of thought that that's the first thing that should be developed Um, you know so it's kind of interesting like is is you know, I, I love reading Young and I, I like he's very interesting, very mm-hmm. interesting to read. Um, but him and Joseph Campbell were my first loves. I always say <laughs> I read Joseph Campbell when I was in uh, high school. I think it was my sophomore year and um, was thoroughly convinced that I was going to marry him um, until I found out that he had already passed away and I was heartbroken. And then, and then I came across Jung and had the same experience. Um, 
although he had passed, you know, <laughs> a lot earlier <laughs> in time. Um, but those were sort of my first two male loves, I'll say. Um, but I also think, so for me, Jung, one of the main contributions, not one of, there's a billion, um, that I think he really like brought to, to light and really advanced so much in our understanding. But I think he really flew in the face of this like unified experience, um, which I re- I still really, really use and appreciate in terms of not this like unified psyche being that is just this one thing that we have all these parts. We have all these archetypes that we tap into and pieces and experiences and it's all us. It's not fragmented or this is better than that one, or we may have more primary parts and more lesser parts, but sort of the thing. And then we can sort of have this like awareness in the center of all of these pieces, but all of it is us. We're not, we don't have to be, you know, this straight and narrow arrow of like self to Mm. have self-understanding. Or awareness. I actually think the the greater self awareness is understanding how diversified we are within our own beings, yes. and that it's okay to hold all of it, mm. right? Mm. Um, and that we're capable of everything. the The worst yeah. of the worst and the best of the best. And the more we're aware of that, the less likely we are to be overcome by it. Mm. the less likely the unconscious is going to be playing out in the shadows, um, sort of behind the scenes, creepy ways. Um, yeah. One of my other favorite, favorite parts is, is the transcendent function. I just still think that's just brilliant. This sort of like experience of the tension between opposites and being able to hold that tension within your system for that third to come forward. But Again, when I talk about like anything that I do, I want to be looking at like what's creating more space and freedom within one system. And I think Mm -hmm. that transcendent function, that ability to hold tension of opposites or different feelings or different experiences, curiosity comes into play of like, oh, it's okay to have all of these different things. It doesn't have to be one way and only one way because through more and more trauma or through experiences where our, our, especially the autonomic nervous system which gets stuck in like one of those phases, it's sort of like gray goes out the window. Everything becomes really, really polarized versus more sort of like enmeshed or gray or curious curiosity d- completely disappears. Um, you know, the difference between talking to like, a four-year-old and hearing about everything that they're curious about and, and all of that versus like, you know, a 44-year-old where it's like, nope, this is the way and this is it and da 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 this is the truth and there's no other way, you know, that's a rigid polarity versus the mm-hmm. openness and the expansiveness of being able to hold all these different pieces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think curiosity is central and like, even going back to what you were saying there just a moment ago, you know, this self-understanding is kind of developed through self-observation in a way, but, you know, even Jung spoke about like looking at the self objectively and that's a very difficult thing to do, but I think it comes from curiosity, right? You need to be able to look at yourself objectively, right? It takes this curiosity to be able to have this mindset, to be able to, you know, Maybe think, okay, well, here are the maladaptive patterns or whatever it may be, right? Like, and that's a very, very challenging thing to do, I think. And um, and trying to do it as, yeah. as you're saying, sort of like as objectively, as neutrally as possible. Yeah. Is that big difference between like, oh, this maladaptive behavior that I created in order to survive <laughs> for whatever reason, I don't need to know the reason but it helped me survive at some point in time. And that's why I'm doing it. So I'm grateful for it. And at the same time, like there's nothing wrong. I would just like to try this other thing. I would just Mm -hmm. like to have curiosity and openness towards like, what if I responded differently when this person says this 
Or what if I responded differently when somebody cuts me off in traffic than I have in the past? You know, just who knows? Who knows what could happen? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I think it's important not to demonize the maladaptive patterns in array where there's a negative connotation towards them. But like you're saying here, like they were developed to allow you to maintain this psychological equilibrium growing up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, especially, I mean, assuming it happened when you're younger, right? Obviously it did. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say here? You know, like it's, yeah. it's something that was a, it was a necessary component of your existence for that to happen. And so it's, not something that you should demonize. We shouldn't demonize our physical bodies. We shouldn't demonize. There's no need for us to have these, even though it has a negative connotation, to have a negative look on it, right? Because then you're not taking that neutral stance either, right? That's so important in looking at yourself objectively. Yeah. Well, and I will say that I feel like change happens much more quickly if you can maintain that more neutral objective stance versus engaging that inner critic to come in and be like, I'm bad and this is wrong and blah, blah, blah. I have to change this. Like, you know, just think of it in terms of like parents and children. It's like the more a child gets scolded, does that make them better? (laughs) Like not generally, it's going to create more adaptations just to be able to survive and make it through. Mm -hmm. versus like hey maybe we just try this other avenue (laughs) this could be fun (laughs) yeah that's such a great outlook such a great outlook i love it uh that's great i think we we got to wrap it up around here now so i want to open the floor and just hear any final thoughts anything you want to add or you think you might have missed throughout the session that you want to bring up i don't know uh No, just, I mean, I really, I guess just continuing to hit this home, like the compassion for yourself that whatever these patterns are, whatever ways that you've created um, for your experience at some point served you. And so having that gratitude for them um, is going to be the thing that changes it more quickly. And Mm -hmm. the more you develop your relationship with your own self, with your own body, with these parts of yourself, with holding all of this, you know, all the variety within your being, um, feeling into your physical senses and and being here in the present moment, that's also going to help you in your relations outside. So that's going to help you have better relationships with your parents, your children, your spouse, your friends all of that, um, because you will actually be showing up as yourself. Um, I think a lot of us have sort of adapted and switched and sort of morphed into whatever it is that we think gets liked and gets approval and, you know, for whatever reasons. And um, yeah, how can you get to know yourself? What do you like? What kind of music do you like? What kind of food do you actually like? What kind of textures do you actually like? What kind of smells do you actually like, you know, versus like, oh, this is just what my family ate growing up. And so that's what I eat. Like, is that true Hmm. for you? Is that actually, it could be, I'm not saying it's not, I'm just saying like, have you questioned it? (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, now maybe you can tell the listener how they can support you, learn more from you, yeah. you know, where they can find you on the internet. Cool. Um, so my website is uh, sophiefletcherphd.com. Um, it's a pretty simple website. I created it. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can message me through there. So if you want to get in contact with me, there's a contact on that. Um, and then I'm on Instagram at sophiefletcher.phd. Pretty sure there's a dot um, after sophiefletcher.phd. Um, so you can also, you know, contact me there or I don't post a ton, but maybe someday I will post more. Um, those are the main ways. Yeah. Um, I, I teach within, um, my husband, Yerasimos, he has a podcast here for the truth and I teach within their membership community, a monthly group call, and also I'm part of their telegram group to answer nervous system, somatic, human design 
questions and things. Um, so I'm there as well. I go to a lot of the, you know, in-person conferency things. Like I was just at Confluence um, uh, earlier this month. I almost said last month and I was like, nope, it was like a week ago. Um, I'm going to be at Music and Sky coming up um, in June. Uh, that's super, super fun and amazing. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, really well, we'll put the links down below too. So it should be easy to find Yeah. Listen, I learned so much today. I really, really, really appreciate you coming on. I know the guests or the listeners will appreciate you coming on as well. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for anybody who is listening. Um, I love doing these things. So I love having these conversations. Thanks so much. You ask great questions. Yeah. <laughs> I love having these conversations too. So that works out well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thanks. Yeah. All right. I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, you should know that it's not medical advice or psychotherapeutic advice or psychological advice in any form, any way. <laughs> this is for your general informational purposes only. Uh, but all, remember, we're all sovereign, responsible beings capable of thinking, understanding, criticizing absolutely anything. Uh, with people in the greater forces that are together, self-healers, self-governable, self-teachers, and so much more, please reach out if you have any questions, criticism, comments, concerns. If you want to argue if you want to agree i'm open you guys know where to find me on instagram uh yeah and i really appreciate you guys checking it out today so best way to support is to share like comment review follow subscribe whatever you're on you you know how to use your platform so uh that'd be great and helping us get this word out and uh help us grow a little bit more so yeah just keep in mind that there are two types of people in this world those who believe they can and those who believe they can't and they're both correct <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for listening. Take care.